So welcome everybody to this TUC Toll Puddle online session on promoting human rights in trade deals. I am Rosa Crawford, the TUC Policy Officer for Trade, and I'll be chairing this session today. I'm really pleased to say we're joined by two fantastic panelists to discuss this important issue. We have Emily Thornbury, Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade, and Diohanez Ojuela, President of the CUT Trade Union Confederation in Colombia, who is joining us from Colombia today. So you're both very welcome. Um, for those who are joining us a little later, just to remind everybody that we are running this session according to the TUC's Code of Conduct, which you can find in the chat box um, and please use the chat for posting comments but for any questions uh, that, that you want to um, post to uh, the panelists today please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We will be uh, tweeting updates from this session today and we hope you will too so uh, please use the hashtag TallPuddle2020 handle um, and at TallPuddleFest for your tweets. And uh, as I said earlier, this session is being recorded uh, and will be posted on the TUC Toll Puddle site uh, shortly. Um, so the way we're going to run this session is I'll give a bit of an introduction for the TUC uh, and then I will hand over to Emily and then I'll hand over to Diohanes and then we'll have time for Q&A and uh, discussion. So, um, oh, and to remind everybody that uh, the session is available in English and Spanish. So uh, just uh, go to the green glow button at the bottom of your screen and click on either English or Spanish uh, to hear the appropriate uh, language you want to listen to. So to give a bit of background about why we wanted to hold this session today, um, I think it's never been clearer how important it is for trade unionists and working people to be aware of how trade deals affect their rights, pay and conditions at work. Trade deals are legal documents, which means they can introduce laws that protect workers' rights and introduce penalties against governments that abuse those rights, just as being part of the EU treaties when we were in the EU required the UK to introduce a whole range of rights, such as paid holiday and sick pay. But as trade unionists, we also know that trade deals have the power to also do the opposite and put in place rules that increase the power of multinational companies without requirements that government ensure labor and human rights standards are respected. And whilst many trade deals do make mention of commitments to international labor organization standards, such as the UK's trade deal with Colombia that we will be particularly focusing on today, they don't contain any mechanism to enforce these commitments, which means in practice they get ignored. So the TUC has been working with trade unions across the world, including with our comrades in the CUT in Colombia, for trade deals to require respect for workers' rights, not lower standards, or indeed put public services at risk. It's a really important um, priority for the TUC that we make sure the UK government secures a trade deal with the EU that puts in place those high standards of rights. And we do have an offer that the EU has put on the table uh, for a deal that would ensure a high standard of rights, as well as the tariff free, low barrier trade that we need to protect millions of jobs in the UK. But we also know that the UK government continues to reject this deal and instead is going for a minimal deal with the EU and trade deals with the likes of the Trump in the US. And we know what that means. The US has stated openly in its trade objectives that it wants to bring down regulations on safety standards and other worker protections as condition for a deal with the UK. We're also concerned by the other trade deals the UK government has agreed with 19 countries. These are trade deals that they had as EU uh, trade deals before we left the EU, and they're called continuity deals. And none of these agreements contain commitments to enforce workers' rights um, or, or safety standards or protections for public services. And one of these continuity deals is the UK Andean Agreement, which involves Colombia, Peru and Ecuador. Now, as I say, the UK-Colombia Agreement contains commitments on paper to enforce ILO standards, but no mechanism for enforcement. But in that way, it's basically identical to the EU's trade agreement with Colombia. The only thing trade unions have in the UK and the EU's agreement with Colombia to hold countries to account for commitments to monitoring labour standards are 
these civil society monitoring bodies called domestic advisory groups that they establish, which involve trade unions, employers and other civil society groups. But the key problem with them is that they have no power to trigger investigations or a process for penalties of countries that abuse rights. It's purely voluntary whether the countries involved accept the recommendations of domestic advisory groups. And both the TUC and the CUT in Colombia have sat on the EU Colombia domestic advisory group, use that to raise concerns when there have been gross violations of labour rights, uh, but there is not yet action uh, to date taken by the EU against Colombia for this. And so it's great in this session that we have Diogenes to talk about his experiences um, of sitting on the domestic advisory groups, where they have been useful for putting pressure on the Colombian government and pressure on the EU to take action against Colombian government, but where they still have limitations, because these are what we need to address also in the UK Colombia trade agreement. And we know that trade agreements do not currently have adequate provisions in them to enforce labour rights because trade unions haven't been involved in the process of negotiation. And this differs starkly from the situation in other countries where there's a more developed culture of social dialogue, such as Sweden or Austria, but also in countries like the US, which is obviously not known for having uh, a culture of social dialogue or good relation between government and trade unions conventionally. However, in the US, trade unions are also routinely consulted on the text of trade negotiations, and that has meant they've got to push for important improvements to those agreements to strengthen labor rights. So the TUC has been working uh, with Emily and her colleagues in the Labour Party, particularly in the context of the trade bill that's currently before the UK Parliament, to push for provisions in the UK law that ensure that trade unions are involved in the process of trade negotiations so that we can make sure they have adequate provisions in them to protect workers' rights as well as uh, our public services and other important social standards. So that's what I want to say in terms of introduction and, and the rationale for today's session. And with that, I'd like to hand over first to Emily to talk more about the work that she's been doing um, as Labour's lead on international trade and in the context of the trade bill, as well as with uh, international colleagues uh, to push forward on the agenda for workers' rights to be enforced in trade agreements. Uh, just to say a few words to, to introduce Emily, as I say, she's the Shadow Secretary of State for International Trade. Previous to this, she was Shadow Foreign Secretary and held a number of other Shadow Cabinet roles, and she is a Member of Parliament for Islington South and Finsbury and was elected in 2005. So Emily, I'm very pleased to be able to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to join you all today, comrades, and to be part of this magnificent effort to keep the Martyrs Festival alive and flourishing even when we can't be gathered together. Um, yes, the Shadow International Trade Secretary. I'm told that in international, the International Trade Department I am regularly referred to as the shit, which I'm proud of. <laughs> um, but it's a pleasure as well to be, to be able to speak to you about the issue of trade and workers' rights. Um, we know that these are dark days for the economy, not just in Britain, but all around the world. And there is one thing that we know that uh, history has taught us, is that when the structures of a capitalist economy, the free market and global trade are under threat from recession or depression, the first thing that goes out of the window, uh, the very first thing, and the first thing that we have to protect are the rights of working men and women all around the world. And let's be honest with ourselves, this isn't just altruism on our part, it's also about solidarity with our comrades overseas. But it's also about recognition that in tough economic times, the biggest corporations will always look to relocate production to countries where wages are lowest and workers are most vulnerable to exploitation. So the governments around the world whose response to this economic crisis is to cut wages, cut labor rights, cut regulation in an effort to lure the big corporations are not just threatening their own workers, but are threatening jobs, livelihoods, and communities here in Britain as well. So we have an immediate fight on our hands in respect of that threat, but we also in this country face a wider challenge. And to me, it seems I, I have a different view, which is that it's a potential opportunity when it comes to international trade. Because for 50 years, our country's trade policy have been set at, 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 uh, at European level, 
And I was just thinking the other day, you know, that we're sadly missing the voice of Dennis Skinner. Um, and since we're missing his voice in Parliament, we don't, have a current, we don't have a single current member of the House of Commons who was sitting in Parliament the last time that the UK actually set its own trade policies. But you know, when I've been discussing the trade, trade bill that's currently before the House of Commons or the trade deals that are being negotiated with the United States or Japan or the dozens of other countries around the world, the, the main question that I've been asking the, the government is simply this. Now that we finally have control of our own policy again, after 50 years, are you rising to this his historic significance of this moment? Are you rising to this challenge? Are you facing it? Are you seizing the opportunity? Or are you just offering more of the same? And you know, what's the plan? What's the vision? Because I believe it's a really big opportunity you know, that we have as a country. Indeed, I'd go further and call, call it an obligation to ensure that issues that were barely a consideration 50 years ago, last time we had our own trade policy, issues such as climate change and gender equality, human rights and workers' rights, are now at the heart of every proposed trade deal that the UK is negotiating. I think that's what we should be doing. And we should be engaging the other major economies as we negotiate our trade deals and be raising this and be making sure that we are updating trade policy internationally and not, and not being afraid of facing these issues. We should be guaranteeing that this will be the case. I believe that the trade bill that's going through Parliament um, now and is going to have its final reading in the House of Commons on Monday should have contained clauses requiring the government to make the agreement and maintenance of those future trade deals conditional on the protection of both, par of both parties, of workers' rights, of human rights and the environment. And then the time I've got today, I want to focus particularly on the opportunity when it comes to workers' rights. If just for a second, you could think about the situation Britain has been in the last four years since the referendum. It's one of the largest and most developed economies in the world, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution and of the trade union movement. But here we are, we're starting all over again with a blank sheet of paper when it comes to international trade, free to negotiate whatever agreements we choose and set the terms of our own negotiation. Isn't that an opportunity to express those values through trade deals you know, that are important to this country? It seems to me that it was kind of one of the best opportunities we as a nation will ever have to insist that any country that wants to trade freely with Britain must respect the same rights and values. We can be a force for good internationally by doing this. And yet we have a department that seems to have no vision at all. You know, I mean, for workers, it should mean the right to organize and form a union, the right to collective bargaining, the right to equal pay for equal work, and the right to strike. It means freedom from intimidation, dismissal, detention, and violence for union organizers and for striking workers. And it means the elimination of child labor, forced labor, and workplace discrimination. And I believe that our message to other countries should simply have been, if you don't respect and protect the rights of your workers, if you fail to abide by such fundamental principles, those that are set out by the International Labour Organization, and if you allow major corporations to exploit child labour or, or murder union leaders with impunity, then we're not going to do a free trade agreement with you. And the sad reality is, is that this Tory government has done pretty much exactly the opposite in its desperation to agree free trade deals to fill the hole that they have created for themselves by such a bad Brexit negotiations. They've sent a message to every other country which says, we want your trade and how you treat your workers is really none of our business. And that's why when you look at the top 10 worst countries in the world for workers' rights, according to the, to the International Trade Union Convention, this Tory government has already signed free trade deals with two of them, Colombia and Guatemala, and is in active negotiations with three more, Algeria, Egypt and Turkey, to secure free trade deals before the end of the year. And if you look at the full list of 40 countries identified by the ITUC as in the bottom category for workers' rights, then you can see that the government has either reached free trade agreements or is in active negotiations with 15 of them. So there's the five I've already mentioned, um, and then there's also the likes of South Korea, Honduras, and Zimbabwe. 
And in the next category of 40 countries where the ITUC records systematic violence, violation of workers' rights, there are new UK agreements in place or being negotiated with more than half of them. Dozens of the free trade agreements either negotiated over the past year or still in the process of negotiation. All of them could have been negotiated by modern up-to-date standards. But not one of them, not one of them can these Tories point to and say that they have been any sort of accomplishment, that they have achieved in any way stronger guarantees and better protections for the rights of working people as a result of those agreements. In fact, in the majority of cases, workers' rights have either been not been on the negotiating table at all, or as has already been said in the case of Colombia, they have the same weak and ineffective provisions that existed under the EU's free trade agreement and they've simply been replicated without discussion. And it's really not good enough. It's a wasted opportunity in my view, and it's something that a Labour government will guarantee to do differently by insisting that every free trade agreement that we sign contains meaningful clauses requiring both parties to protect workers' rights with meaningful penalties if those clauses are broken. And as long as we remain in opposition, we're going to harry the government and will continue to harry the government at every turn, demanding the inclusion of those clauses in the deals that, they are, that they're negotiating. So whether it's Egypt or Algeria or Turkey, Malaysia, Mexico, Ukraine, it may be impossible to get the trade bill amended to guarantee the inclusion of workers' rights clauses in those future trade deals. But Labour must and will use the opportunity anytime these issues are under discussion to highlight the violation of workers' rights in countries with whom the government is negotiating. We're going to make sure that ministers know the name of Raoum Melan. He was the pre president of the Gas and Electricity Workers' Union in Algeria, violently arrested during a peaceful demonstration last year, interrogated in handcuffs, strip searched, sexually harassed, and even charged with slander against the state-owned electricity company. And we're gonna make sure that ministers have to face up to what's happening at the Aswan cement plant in Egypt three years ago this month when employees protesting about their colleagues who had been killed while working in unsafe conditions, were beaten, arrested, and forced to work. And we're gonna make sure that the ministers negotiating a trade deal with Turkey are forced to confront the mounting evidence of the use of forced labor, child labor, refugee labor, to fuel its booming fast fashion industry, and explain how we can be agreeing a deal with Istanbul if it continues to ignore the plight of those workers. And in opposition, you know, in opposition, it, this is all that we can do, but it's important that we do it well and that we make a big noise about it, one that's heard across the country and one that the government can't ignore. So I'm proud to be lead, leading that work in Westminster, and I'm extremely grateful to have the support of everybody taking part today. I've just got one final thought, if, if you don't mind, Rosa, um, that I want to share with, with all of you, which is that in the debate that we're having in Westminster over the government's trade bill, as I said, we've been ourselves fighting for the recognition of workers' rights around the world, but we've also been fighting on other issues of vital importance for the trade union movement here in Britain, such as the rules and competition for government procurement of services and for the representation of our unions on the UK's new Trade Remedies Authority to protect our industries against unfair competition from overseas governments. But we've also been finding ourselves in a very bitter fight over the future of food and farming standards in our country and the threat that is posed to them by a free trade deal with the United States that will allow the big US agricultural corporations to import their cheap and frankly substandard production standards um, and their disregard for animal welfare into our country. And the fact that it's the Labour Party that's leading that fight against a Conservative government for the protection of our farming communities and the traditional way of doing things on our farms may seem strange to some people. But what the Tolpuddle Martyrs Festival reminds us, and going back even further into the history of socialism in our country to the enclosure riots and the diggers, is that we as a movement owe our origins as much to early 19th century farmhands in Dorset as to late 19th century factory workers in Lancashire. 
and we should therefore be proud to lead the fight against the Tory party that wants to allow Donald Trump and his friends in the agricor industry to undercut British farmers and undermine the food standards that we have in this country. So I hope that in addition to all the other messages of solidarity and resistance that come out of this festival this weekend, one of those will be with the British farming communities and British farm workers who are facing that threat. So thank you. And thank you all for inviting me to take part in the celebration. Thank you very much for that, Emily, which was a really um, powerful contribution. And I think it's really important to draw the link between those um, food safety standards and the workers' rights conditions, because uh, absolutely it affects workers if, if food is sprayed with chemicals and conditions are not safe. And I think that's important for us to make clear in, in the debate um, that, that sometimes becomes reduced. Uh, just to the issue of chlorinated chicken. And it's really um, great to, to have the pledge from you that a Labour government would support uh, effective enforcement of uh, Labour standards in trade agreements signed under a Labour government and making sure that there are effective penalties in place. And that's something that's absolutely crucial to prevent and race to the bottom. As you say, um, and thank you for all your work to date with the, with the union movement holding the government to account around the trade bill. And we look forward to our, our continued to work with you on that and there are questions already coming in for Emily please continue to post questions for Emily or Diohones on the uh, Q&A at the bottom and we will come to you uh, at the end of the session uh, but now I'd like to hand over to uh, Diohones Ojuela who is the president of the Colombian Trade Union Confederation the CUT which has over 546,000 members Diohanes represents Colombia at the International Labour Organization and is also a representative of the National Peace Council. The TUC has long worked with the CUT in Colombia against violations um, committed against trade unionists, which continue to this day, with over 3,000 murdered in recent years. I'm sure many of you know that the TUC and many of our affiliated unions created a solidarity organization called Justice for Colombia, which has worked closely with the CUT in its activities to support the peace process. Despite the peace agreement signed in November 2016, we still see hundreds of social leaders assassinated and trade unionists targeted to this day. As I mentioned at the start, Diohanes is part of the EU Colombia Domestic Advisory Group that monitors the extent to which the Colombian government is upholding its commitments made in the EU Andean trade deal to uphold core international organ labor organization standards. So Diohanes, it's great to be able to hand over to you now for your experiences. Uh, a note to participants that uh, if you would want to hear it, the interpretation, just click the green globe at the bottom and you can select English for your channel. But Diohanes, I'd like to hand over to you now, please. Eh, muy buenas tardes para todos eh, ustedes. Eh, un abrazo y un saludo muy fraternal para todos los compañeros y las compañeras de TUC. Eh, para Rosa, Emily, nuestra amiga Mariela eh, de acá de Colombia, que ha sido un apoyo enorme en el Reino Unido. Para todos los que están conectados, nuestros amigos de Europa, Maricriste, un abrazo de Francia, te vi por ahí. Decirles que para nosotros ha sido supremamente importante eh, esta relación de hace muchas décadas entre eh, la Central Unitaria de Trabajadores de Colombia y tú de, de Inglaterra, que ese, esa relación igualmente acompañada de Justicia por Colombia ha sido muy importante como muy importante el respaldo y la solidaridad del movimiento sindical eh, internacional. Eh, nunca dejaré de mencionar que sin la solidaridad y el apoyo internacional, la situación del de movimiento sindical en Colombia y de los luchadores sociales en Colombia y defensores de derechos humanos sería muchísimo más, más difícil. Eh, la Confederación Sindical Internacional, la Confederación Europea de Sindicatos, la Confederación Sindical de las Américas, 
eh, el TUAG en, en la OSDE, eh, han sido todos, y las federaciones sindicales internacionales, han sido todas de, de un apoyo eh, maravilloso. Y ese apoyo maravilloso en la lucha y en la denuncia por la defensa de los derechos humanos, por eh, la denuncia de los asesinatos, por la denuncia de, las, de la impunidad en las investigaciones por más de 3.500 asesinatos desde la creación de nuestra central, eh, han sido muy importantes en el debate que hemos librado en esa decisión de Colombia de la firma de... Eh, cerca de 20 tratados eh, o acuerdos eh, de libre comercio, la mayoría muy desventajosos para, para nuestro país, que han llevado a que en, el, en este momento de la crisis y la emergencia generada por el COVID-19, eh, la situación del país sea muchísimo más eh, grave. Eh, en el debate del acuerdo comercial con la Unión Europea, que finalmente terminó siendo una negociación independiente entre la Unión Europea, eh, independiente con Colombia, separada con Perú, separada con Ecuador, eh, en esa negociación o en la ratificación de ese acuerdo, eh, TUG jugó un papel muy importante para el debate que se dio eh, en, en todo el Reino Unido alrededor de, de la ratificación de ese tratado. Si no me equivoco, faltan todavía aún, aún unas pocas ratificaciones en, en, en Europa. Pero ese ha sido el debate, principalmente con los acuerdos comerciales de Estados Unidos, de Canadá, de la Unión Europea, el tema del ingreso de Colombia a la OCDE. Ha sido todo un debate por una actitud un, y un comportamiento muy definido en este país de, de no gustar o de no aceptar la posibilidad de que el país tenga buenas condiciones laborales, sea respetuoso de los derechos en general de los trabajadores, pero sobre todo ese comportamiento de considerar que el país no puede aceptar la existencia de grandes sindicatos para los servidores públicos y para los servidores de las empresas privadas. Aquí, en, en, utilizando una palabra muy, muy, muy de nuestro español, aquí el movimiento sindical tiene que abrirse espacio a codazos, peleando día y noche con la actitud de sectores empresariales. Hay sectores empresariales que hay que valorarles, un comportamiento de aceptación del movimiento sindical. Pero la actitud de sectores empresariales que entre más poderosos son, mayor acción hacen para destruir los sindicatos, para destruir a los, a los dirigentes eh, sindicales. Por eso el debate en las ratificaciones de los tratados, de los acuerdos de libre comercio, siempre ha estado acompañado de, de, de este tema. Eso es lo que explica... Que, por ejemplo, el acuerdo comercial, el debate en el Congreso de los Estados Unidos, fue un debate de casi seis años, eh, en el que, como estaban al frente los republicanos, eh, los demócratas impidieron la ratificación por estos problemas. Lamentablemente, eh, cuando asume Barack Obama, eh, con los republicanos y algún sector de los demócratas terminan ratificando el acuerdo, acompañado o condicionándolo a la firma de lo que se llamó un plan de acción laboral que duró cuatro años, que finalmente no tuvo cumplimiento y entonces se ha ido eh, haciendo un trabajo por las denuncias nuestras. Todo esto acompañado indiscutiblemente con el movimiento sindical norteamericano eh, de la AFL CIO y plataformas y organizaciones sociales que nos han acompañado siempre en esos, en esos procesos. En ese, en ese contexto, hoy lo que hay es un seguimiento de progresos por parte del Departamento de Trabajo de los Estados Unidos con una convicción que permanecerá 
en todos. Es que este es un gobierno que firma y que no, y que no cumple. Pero de igual manera se da el debate en, en, la, Unión, en la Unión Europea, en donde también para avanzar en, y con la ayuda de, de, de todo el movimiento sindical europeo, ese papel tan importante que jugó tú en el Reino Unido, el acompañamiento, el acompañamiento de parlamentarios eh, eh, de distintos países de Europa en el debate en el Parlamento Europeo y los debates de ratificación en cada uno de los Estados miembros eh, dura una buena cantidad de tiempo por los mismos asuntos. Eso es lo que motiva que en el acuerdo también se, te, se deban introducir cláusulas de protección eh, laboral, ambiental y, y de otros de, y de los derechos y de los derechos eh, humanos. Igual debate se da en, en, en Canadá, en donde el, en la CLC de Canadá, el, el Canadian Labor Congress, eh, eh, trabaja igualmente como movimiento sindical en ese debate y el gobierno debe canadiense introduce en el acuerdo cláusulas laborales por las mismas motivaciones. Este es el debate permanente en, en, en la Organización Internacional del Trabajo y fue el debate que eh, afortunadamente pudimos tener una participación eh, muy interesante, ayudados por el Trade Union Advisory Committee, eh, eh, que también duró seis años, casi siete años, para que se produjese el ingreso de Colombia a la, a la Organización de Cooperación al Desarrollo Ecor Económico OSDE. Eh, debate brillante y importante, UDETUC nos acompañó, nos acompañaron casi todos los países de Europa muy eficazmente, Estados Unidos, Canadá, Alemania, Inglaterra, eh, nos acompañaron en el Comité de Empleo y Asuntos, y Asuntos Sociales. Fue una experiencia riquísima, fue unos debates inter, interesantísimos y salen de allí, sale de, en, en la opinión formal de ese comité, eh, salen unas recomendaciones que son el resumen de lo que hay en todos los otros acuerdos y que son el resumen también de las recomendaciones eh, de, la, de, la, de la Organización Internacional eh, del Trabajo, que es eliminar las formas abusivas de contratación, es el tema de la informalidad, es el tema del desempleo, las altísimas tasas de desempleo, pero es el tema de la decisión, de la decisión, y voy aquí a este tema que es muy importante. Ahora eh, Emily habla mucho de cláusulas obligatorias. Todas estas cláusulas tienen un problema, ¿cierto? Es que no tienen, en, en el fondo, no tienen cómo sancionar al país porque no las cumpla. Mientras que en los temas comerciales eh, siempre estará, y el país ha sido víctima inclusive de esas cláusulas en el que el país puede ser denunciado porque no cumple eh, y, he, y ha sido amarga la experiencia. Tenemos un debate con la Unión Europea porque no ha cumplido con la importación de papas procesadas eh, de Bélgica. ¿sí? Tenemos un debate con los Estados Unidos porque el país no ha cumplido con los compromisos de importación eh, de, de tractocamiones etcétera, si se incumplen las cláusulas laborales, todavía no hay un solo proceso en el mundo de los cuales el Colombia tenga, tenga eh, eh, una sanción y ha incumplido todos los compromisos en materia laboral. El mejor ejemplo lo resumo en esto. El año antes de que, de que, desde que asumió este gobierno, eh, ha venido un gran debate de que hay que hacer una reforma laboral, plantea el gobierno y plantean los grandes gremios económicos. Nosotros hemos dicho las únicas reformas laborales que hay que hacer en Colombia son las que ha recomendado la, el mundo internacional, las que ha recomendado la Unión Europea, etcétera, todo esto que les he mencionado a ustedes, ¿sí? pero las reformas que están planteando en el país. Ahora, lo que habían venido planteando lo hemos impedido con grandes movilizaciones. Veníamos en muy grandes movilizaciones hasta cuando llega eh, la crisis sanitaria. 
el confinamiento los lleva a plantear que aprovechando las facultades extraordinarias del gobierno, los gremios, el, el consejo gremial, que se llama así a los grandes gremios económicos, han planteado que hay que aprovechar la crisis y las facultades casi dictado, de, de dictador del presidente Duque, que hay que aprovechar para hacer la reforma laboral, para eliminar más derechos de los trabajadores. ¿sí? Yo alguna, eh, alguna vez en un evento en Bélgica, eh, que organizaron unos ilustres profesores, eh, creo, no, no recuerdo bien si, si de si de Inglaterra o de, o de Irlanda o de Escocia, ellos eh, eh, hicieron, un, nos hice, hicieron un evento donde estábamos Colombia eh, y estaban otros dos países para hablar de que si eran más efectivas las cláusulas europeas o las cláusulas norteamericanas. Eh, yo allí dije una cosa, estas cláusulas más, cumplen más un papel de adorno democrático ¿sí? para darle un toque democrático a esos acuerdos comerciales que, que cumplir de verdad una acción eficaz de obligar a estos, a estos gobiernos. Por, por lo que dije inicialmente, no, 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 son, no, no, no son efectivas, no las hacen efectivas porque todos debemos entender que en general los acuerdos comerciales juegan ese papel fundamental que es facilitar la apertura de los mercados ¿sí? a las potencias económicas frente a unas economías economías que son mucho más débiles, que exponencialmente tienen menos capacidad de crecimiento, pero que tienen un problema, que al aumentar las exportaciones hacia nuestros países, generan un detrimento, un debilitamiento muy grave de, eh, de nuestros aparatos productivos. Yo voy a dar dos cifras muy importantes. En 1990, cuando Colombia... Eh, entró en la globalización neoliberal, la agricultura participaba con un, en, en, en el Producto Interno Bruto, la agricultura participaba en un 22% de nuestro PIB eh, de, de 1990. Hoy, la agricultura, después de pleno ejercicio de los acuerdos comerciales, solo participa con un 6%. Es decir, nuestra agricultura se arruinó y se acabó casi totalmente. Nuestra industria participaba en, los, en 1990 en el PIB de Colombia en un 21%. Por, en un 21 Ahora, nuestra industria solo participa escasamente con un 10% del PIB. Eso ha sido un efecto no solamente de la política arancelaria, sino que ha sido el efecto de los acuerdos comerciales, porque además, a partir del de año 2012, que ya estaban en vigencia todos estos acuerdos comerciales, nuestra balanza comercial se volvió negativa. Colombia, hasta el año 2010-2012, tenía eh, una balanza positiva, promedio de 2.000, 3.000 millones de dólares anuales. De entre el año 2012 hasta 2020, ha habido años en que el país ha tenido una balanza comercial negativa hasta de 15.000 millones de dólares. Hoy está en unos 6.000, 7.000 millones de dólares y nuestro país, de igual manera, eh, ha, ha caído en un problema que es de depender ya no de la producción agrícola, ya no de la producción eh, industrial, sino a depender de la exportación de minerales. Dependemos del petróleo, dependemos del carbón, dependemos del oro y, de, y dependemos de otros pequeños commodities de materia extractiva. Eso no da el empleo, eso ha generado entonces que Colombia, desde hace más de 10 años, tengamos uno de los más altos índices de desempleo de toda la región. Estamos, eh, estamos, estábamos y llevamos cinco años con un crecimiento continuado del desempleo. Había llegado a índices del 12%, 
hasta febrero de este año y llegó al 22% ya por el tema del confinamiento y de la cuarentena generada por el COVID-19. COVID estas, estas situaciones eh, llevan a que la situación de la... Ahora, pero eso ha generado, eso, eh, además del desempleo, ha generado unos índices de informalidad agobiantes. Colombia tiene en la informalidad, es decir, personas que no tienen empleo, que viven del de día a día, que es, lo se llaman, en español es, se llama en los cuenta propia, el gobierno ha dado en llamarlos emprendedores, pero son las personas que su ingreso depende de lo que puedan obtener cada día porque no tienen un empleo fijo. Esa informalidad es del 63% en el país. No la cuentan en los índices de desempleo porque se cuentan, el país los cuenta como, como empleados. Pero hoy, a raíz de estos efectos, de estos acuerdos comerciales, pues han generado todo un, un, un y de globalización neoliberal, eh, generaron una destrucción de nuestro sistema de salud que está en unas condiciones muy Johannes? difíciles para atender eh, una Sorry, extensión um, una extensión de Sorry, Johannes, I wonder if I can ask you to just um, wind up your intervention it's very very interesting but I just want to have time for you to answer okay. the questions that are coming in so is it okay. is it okay to ask you to to conclude bueno, finalizo dos minutos finalizo en dos minutos todo esto todo esto agravado con los asesinatos, siguen asesinando líderes sociales, siguen asesinando líderes sindicales, sigue habiendo violación de los derechos humanos, el gobierno desconoce los acuerdos de paz firmados con, eh, con, las, con las FARC, el gobierno se niega a, una, a un diálogo y negociación política con la otra guerrilla que está... Eh, eh, alzada en armas y en definitiva estamos ante una situación muy grave para todos los colombianos y en especial para los trabajadores. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much for that, Diohanes, and I think that shows really clearly why we need effective enforcement mechanisms in trade agreements rather than the ones that you uh, have in the EU-Colombia uh, agreement and which are the same as in the UK-Colombia agreement. And certainly as TUC, uh, we are working with you and our international partners to push for those changes um, uh, in the EU and the UK. Uh, Colombia agreement um, and to make sure there are effective penalties. Uh, sorry to have to, to bring you to a close, but I, I think it will um, be great to hear from um, uh, the, the participants about the questions they want to ask from these rich contributions from you and Emily. Uh, so we do now have 15 minutes for questions. Um, and uh, we have some questions coming in already, but if you have more questions, then please do put them into the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and I really have to say that we have uh, other DAG members on this call, other members of the domestic advisory groups that monitor EU trade agreements. Um, and so perhaps we could go to that first question from uh, Marie-Christine Nayod, um, who's on the, from the uh, French um, CGT Union Confederation, and she had a uh, question, uh, will Labour review uh, free trade agreements signed by the current government to add chapters on trade union social rights as well as protection of the environment? Um, and I know that you already started to answer a question from Nick Crook uh, from Unison, Emily, about uh, the UN binding treaty on business and human rights, but perhaps if you wanted to, to answer both of those issues, if you wanted to expand on that response to yeah. Nick as well. So if I hand over to you, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mary Christine. I mean, I think that we we have to. I mean, what I was trying to say in my speech is that is that this is such a fantastic opportunity to try to update trade deals per se across the world. We know that the World Trade Organization is uh, is I mean is can is is ossified really in uh, you know 1995 1994, and we we need to be able to continue to update it and and the way in which 
it seems to me the, the most effective way of doing it is to get groups of like-minded nations together to agree certain standards and then be able to move on. I think that the Tories approach to um, trade deals is just not ambitious enough. It's just, it's too, it, it, it's full of sort of fake puff, but actually not, re it doesn't really have a strategy. And, and I think the lack of strategy is just a tremendously wasted opportunity and one where Britain could be a force for good. And that's something that we should be proud of, or we should be excited by. We should be thinking about, well, how can we get involved in this? We've always been a great trading nation. Let's see what we can do in terms of, of reforming and updating um, the way in which uh, countries trade with one another, which kind of takes me on to Nick's point, um, which I was in the process of answering and then realized that I was getting too distracted with answer with, and I ought to have been listening. So I, I gave up giving a full answer. I think that there's recently in, in British law, there's been the introduction of legislation which has a kind of proactive role like the Human Rights Act or the Bribery Act, where there's a positive duty put on to parties um, so that it isn't just, a, so most law is about don't do this, don't do this, you're not allowed to do that. If you do this, then you'll get into trouble. But actually with these laws, it is you have a positive duty to make sure that you change your ways or that you, or that you check to make sure that you're doing things in the right way. And that's what we have in the Human Rights Act. And in the Bribery Act, you know, companies have a positive duty to look at the way in which they're organized and to make sure that they are not vulnerable to, um, to, to perhaps individuals within the company behaving in a way that, uh, that is, you know, that is wrong. And so they had to look at their management processes and be able to say with confidence, we've done everything we can to make sure that none of the individuals within our company are bribing anyone else in order to get a particular contract. And that positive duty being put on companies was I think a, a real step forward in terms of legislation. And I think that way of thinking in terms of, you know, of obligations on countries to make sure that their supply chains have been checked to the best of their ability to be able, I mean, obviously one will never be able to completely eradicate, but I think there's something in the idea of, of giving companies a positive duty to look at their supply chains to make sure that they're, that they're not vulnerable and that they're not using um, labor, that it, where, exploitative labor where they do have proper standards throughout their supply chain. I think there's something about that and I think that it's an important kind of element to introduce and we ought to be doing more thinking about it but I think something along those lines I think Nick is right about. Thank you for that uh, Emily um, and uh, do keep do keep your questions coming in um, but um, I, I thought since we have a moment more to ha have a little bit more um, discussion from Diogenes um, it, it might be useful to hear from you a bit about uh, that that pressure that you managed to bring to bear with trade union partners around the world when Colombia was joining the OECD um, did you feel there are any um, positive uh, reforms made by Colombia in that process of pressure and do you feel that there have been uh, any positive developments from the pressure that that you brought through the domestic advisory group because whilst we don't have any um, hard tools you might say through those domestic advisory groups they are still a platform for us to raise a voice so I wonder if, if there are any positive developments that came from your involvement and collaboration um, putting pressure through the OECD as well as the domestic advisory groups um, on the Colombian government at all. So Diogenes, yeah. Eh, sí, Rosa. Eh, podemos la experiencia de la creación del DAC en Colombia eh, fue una experiencia muy importante. Eh, hubo una actitud de saboteo del gobierno para que no se constituyera el DAC. El gobierno decía que él tenía la facultad de constituirlo y que no era una autonomía de las organizaciones empresariales, sindicales y de, y de organizaciones no gubernamentales. Para que se hagan a una idea de cómo fue el proceso, duramos casi dos años para poder constituir el DAC y la, la ayuda del DAC europeo fue fundamental. La ayuda de la Confederación Europea de Sindicatos fue fundamental para poder obligar al gobierno a que aceptara que nos dábamos nuestra propia organización. Sin embargo, el funcionamiento es muy difícil porque la actitud de los empresarios no es, porque lo logramos hacer con las tres centrales, con una serie de, 
o organizaciones no gubernamentales muy importantes y ambientales y con empresarios. Pero podemos decir que el DAC está, eh, tenemos reuniones muy ocasionales en la Comisión Europea con la señora embajadora, con funcionarios, tenemos relación con el DAC de Ecuador, tenemos relación con el DAC de Perú y tenemos una buena relación con el DAC de Europa. La experiencia fue importante porque fue un debate supremamente duro y complicado. Ya he terminado, Rosa. Okay. So it sounds like there was some tentative progress with the, the political contacts made, but uh, not, not actually reforms uh, as a direct result. Um, and I think that's important to consider in the case of the uh, UK now um, having an agreement with Colombia. And we know diplomatically they are seeking um, to, to build the relationship with Colombia. And certainly we as TUC are keen to Uh, work with you as CUT to ensure that that trade relationship actually does contain uh, effective enforcement on, on labor rights. And uh, we can use these domestic advisory groups to push for change, building on any progress that's been made at the EU level. But understanding it, it, it it's, it's limited to date because of the limitations of the domestic advisory groups. Thanks for that, Diohanes. Um, So we are slightly running out of time, um, but do, if you have any final questions, post them in the Q&A. Uh, we have a question about, um, which is to Emily, around the, the Labour Party uh, potentially annulling trade agreements that don't protect labour and social rights, um, which, which you might have some reflections uh, on, Emily. I, I don't know if you would like to pick that one up, and uh, then I might come back to Dilhanes for any final thoughts. I, I think that the way to do it is to review the is to review them. I mean, I think that the the process of the negotiation is important. So, you know, for example, if a if a if a trade deal has been agreed, and um, and it's and it's been it's been lacking in some of the essential elements that there ought to be there within a trade deal, then we should review it and we should go back to the country and say, look, this is how we, you know, this is how, how this is how we now do trade deals. This is the up-to-date ones. I mean, I think you see it with the EU, you know, the EU older trade, trade deals are, you know, haven't been updated. And I think we need to have a process for updating them um, because I think that there's been a, I mean, I hear what, what, you know, what's said about, you know, none of the, um, The EU hasn't done any any um, enforcement of it, but the but the very fact that there is a negotiation, I think, can have a positive influence and can in itself be used to put some pressure on. Of course, you know, although there is a tool, it's only used as well as someone wishes to use a tool, I suppose, and uh, and that is always the way, isn't it? Um, if they if there isn't the will to use it strongly, I mean, you know, you can see that there are sanctions um, on the United Kingdom because we're making Airbus wings um, from the United States, um, and you know, there may or may not have been state aid um, uh, on Boeing and on Airbus and da 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 da. So there's sanctions when it comes to that, but there doesn't seem to be sanctions when it comes to the sort of appalling um, human rights records of some countries in the world with whom we seem to trade perfectly happily and sometimes in contravention of, uh, of chapters that talk about uh, trade union rights. Thank you, Emily. And I think that's a really important point about using the leverage we have as a, as a force for good. And I think that yes. we'd certainly want to push that point as well. Um, maybe just one final question for Diohanes around the peace process, because obviously that's something that's a very, very important yes. issue that trade unions here have been doing lots of solidarity work in support of. Uh, do you think, Diohanes, that politicians speaking out in the UK on the peace process and where we need to see change and reform helps to influence the government in Colombia because that point around leverage it's important for the UK comrades listening here today to know the impact of when our politicians speak out those such as such Emily and others can speak out about what needs to change in the peace process what, what kind of impact does that have when it's heard in Colombia? Totalmente, totalmente es, es así, Rosa. Indiscutiblemente la presión política internacional es fundamental, es lo que ha logrado de alguna manera contener que eh, este gobierno del presidente Iván Duque 
no vuelva a trizas. Esa es la frase que ellos usaban, no vuelva a trizas los acuerdos eh, de paz. En Colombia tenemos un bloque muy grande de sindicalismo, organizaciones sociales, la bancada de oposición en el Parlamento colombiano, sectores de, de la Iglesia Católica, muy valiosos y somos los que hemos logrado contener que esos acuerdos no sean destrozados, pero de igual manera es, es esa como la decisión del gobierno y la precisión de los parlamentos, de los partidos políticos eh, de fuera es muy importante, quizá es fundamental. Thank you. I think that's really important to hear and for all our international solidarity efforts to know the impact and the real change it can have to people's lives. And when it's a life and death situation, that's very significant uh, for us to all bear in mind. So we are coming to the end of the session, um, but I'd like to thank Diogenes and Emily so much for their really valuable contributions today, which I think has really helped to, to develop our understanding around the importance of enforcing human rights through trade agreements and also the tools of how to do so. It's great that we've also had other members of the domestic advisory groups, these monitoring bodies on the calls today. We've heard that they are very imperfect in their current form to monitor and uh, enforce um, labor rights and trade agreements, but we are all working together, um, TUC, with our international brothers and sisters to improve them. And this is going to be very important in the UK trade agreements as well, that we make sure that we do have an effective process and obviously engaging uh, with Emily and her labor colleagues to make sure that the government is held to account to that in Parliament is really important. So thank you very much for those rich contributions and everybody's questions and comments today. Um, I'd like to have a big thanks to the interpreters who have done a great job today. Thank gracias, Johannes. Um, and uh, thank you. And thank you to all those who've tweeted about this session. Please do look on hashtag Tollpuddle2020 and at TollpuddleFest. And as I've said, we'll, this session will be um, recorded and put up on the Tollpuddle YouTube site. Um, and this is taking part of a, as part of a broader uh, TUC Tollpuddle Festival, um, which is taking place over the next three days. So there's lots of other really interesting talks going on and music and film screenings and lots of other events. So please do check out the Tollpuddle Martyrs Festival website or the Facebook page uh, for information about all the other events and please do sign up. So thank you all once again, our comrades all around the world for being with us um, at this uh, TUC Toll Puddle event today. And I look forward to our continued work together to promote uh, trade union and workers' rights in trade deals. Uh, have a very good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>